Okay, I'll get started. Um, obviously, one of the central challenges of planning and uh, sustainable development design is radically reducing the ecological footprint of urban redevelopment or new urban development. And there's lots of very interesting uh, research and scholarly work uh, and so on on this topic. Uh, but even more interesting are actual projects that demonstrate uh, the feasibility uh, of doing this and provide a really interesting and compelling uh, design solution to this. And today we have uh, some folks that are going to um, tell us about and explain this real project. The project was on the um, Sea Home uh, Power Station in downtown Austin, and this project uh, received, it was a project that came out of the classroom, which is another interesting and exciting uh, aspect to what we're going to hear about today. Uh, and it received the 2005 Student Project of the Year from uh, the Texas uh, Planning, uh, Planning Association, American Association of Planning. Uh, and so, really interested and excited to see this. Um, our people who are going to tell us about this are Professor Kent Butler, who is the Associate Dean, must you know him, but the Associate Dean of um, uh, Research and Operations for the School of Architecture and Professor of the Planning Program. Uh, and um, he's also co-director for the uh, Center for uh, Sustainable Development. The other presenter is Jason Fryer, who is completing his master's degree in architecture this fall, I believe. Uh, so I want to welcome you and I look forward to seeing what you guys are going to show us. Thank you, Michael. I'm going to go first and then give it over to Jason to give the main presentation. So thank you all for coming and uh, look forward to the informal presentation, questions along the way, and general questions and comments at the end, uh, whatever suits you best. Uh, a couple things to start with. One is that um, it seems in many ways that a lot of the work that we do in classrooms is intended to be for the distant future and so forth. And uh, in my uh, experience in teaching, all the things that, that I used to do that were five and ten years out are suddenly, not suddenly, but in the last few years, have become much more urgent. And so this, this whole issue of water and the issues of, of sustainability, uh, even though they've been actively discussed from an academic point of view, really, 25, 35 years, are just so depressing. It's like we're trying to solve yesterday's problems instead of future problems. And uh, one of the things I've learned in recent years is in terms of sustainability in the context of architecture is that one of the most sustainable things one can do is to figure out how to reuse an existing building. You, know, you think about the embedded effort and energy in a building, Portland cement building, which many of you know more than me, the number of hours it takes and what degrees Fahrenheit Portland cement has to be heated in order to come into cement form. And then look at buildings that get torn down when they are obsolete and uh, we build something new. You can reuse that same building and save a tremendous amount of energy and materials. And then of course in the area of water, which is my favorite uh, playground, uh, we're not running out of water, but we're way over committed already. And in many cases what we lack is not just the supply uh, or just the rights to water, but we don't have the infrastructure in place to deliver the water the way we want to. So how are we going to deal with these issues? And along came a, a, a well-intentioned uh, project that was uh, proposed by the city to be something that would be something great to hold on to, to be sustainable. And along came a series of teams, and there was a wonderful competition for the Sea Home Power Project. And the team that won uh, is led by a group called uh, Southwest Strategies Group. And it so it turns out that the uh, principal of that uh, firm is a graduate of the School of Architecture and a uh, former student of mine from 20 years ago. And so you know, through a, a trust relationship and a friendship as well, uh, we explored the possibilities of the university helping that project with the feasibility of something that they would consider doing if it, if it made sense to do so. So imagine this now, you're taking on a project that's going to be in excess of $100 million and the funding does not run out of their pockets, as you can imagine. Money is always borrowed if it's, if it's something big like that. 
And there are probably 15 or 20 different members on that team. I'm not talking individuals, but companies. And so along comes this great idea to do something nice, like a rainwater collection system. Well, how do you, how do you justify it? Is, this, is it good marketing? Is it really going to save so much water and money that it's worth doing? Do people that go there really care? How much water will it save? So the challenge in starting off is, I can tell you now that if it works well, it will save upwards of a million gallons a year. But if, if the sea home merchants bought that water, as you and I buy our water, you know, at today's price, which might be three and a half dollars per thousand gallons, that's $2,500 a year at most, a little over $200 a month. So why should they spend $75,000, $80,000 for a rainwater system, upfront cash, you know, in order to save a couple hundred dollars a month? Would you do that? Maybe if, if, you, if you had the money, you would, but it's not your money. You have to convince someone else to do this. And the people that have to be convinced are more purely business people. So it's one thing for us to preach to the choir, and I know you're all very interested in rainwater systems and you want to see as many of those as you can, but how do we, how do we really make true water reuse happen, right? or, or use water before it even hits the ground? It has to pay for itself. So the objective of this class, and Jason is one out of about I think there were nine people in the class, was to test the economic piece of it. It wasn't hard to come up with the, the spreadsheet model to figure out how much water it could capture. It wasn't that hard to come up with a design, especially for the sea home power project, as you'll see. But the hard part is figuring out, is it worth doing? Will it pay for itself? And how long will it take? And what are the options? And how do you revise the design using the economic models as the controlling influence to say, this is the best that you can do, and it makes really good sense to do so. And uh, we'll see if that happens. Uh, as, it, as it stands now, the sea home power limited team is planning to put in the rainwater system. Uh, it still depends on how much it costs. As such, we went into this project to see what would it look like on an existing building. And uh, Jason's going to walk you through the, the work that we did and the findings that we came to. Uh, I want to say just a couple of other things. In my experience in working in water planning for going on 30 years, I've never found anything as close to a silver bullet as rainwater collection systems for a variety of reasons. One is it provides a feedback. The, the, the building in which the rainwater system occurs is the place where the water is captured. So whoever is the operator of the water system, be it you as a homeowner, or be it Sea Home Power Limited, or be it a whole utility that might someday be operating rainwater systems, they can see how much water they have at any point in time. And that kind of a feedback is something we haven't had in our modern American world, have we? You just, you know, you walk in the bathroom in the morning at whatever hour you wake up and you, your eyes are kind of open enough to find the faucet and you turn. That's, that's how much water you have. It's your ability to find the faucet handle. But knowing that you're down to 40% of the volume of the cistern and it's still only late July and you have some choices and you begin to just kind of plant that in the back of your mind, it's really the kind of transformative way of thinking that we all have to go through if we're really going to make differences. It's not going to be enough to find um, technological solutions or legal solutions. It's going to take transformative behavioral changes in a conscientious way. And I think the, the idea of storage on the site is a wonderful, iconic, uh, and real, tangible use for that to happen. Number two, it's a drinking water supply. Those that have rainwater systems, and some of you know what they do, there's probably over seven or eight hundred residential rainwater systems in Central Texas. They swear by it as the most wonderful tasting water, the best water to wash your hair with. Uh, it is more pH neutral, it doesn't have any of those chemicals that certain water, purified water has, uh, and so forth. And they find it to be the best quality water that they have. Number three, it is a Stormwater management device. All the rain that occurs on the roof flushes off. It gets into the gutters, into the downspouts, into the, the uh, street gutter, and into the creeks. Is now mitigated by how much water is captured and held from those impervious surfaces that the rainwater collection. 
So this is good for our environment in terms of receiving water, to not have those urban flashy flows that come up on every rooftop in an urban area if they have rainwater collection. Secondly, the water that is captured now can be reused. So you have a new source of water, maybe for irrigation, maybe for toilet flush, maybe for potable purposes. And in this case that we're looking at today, in a commercial application, if you think about it, commercial buildings, set aside restaurants and other food service operations, commercial buildings use 50 to 95 percent of their water for non-potable purposes. And as such, the opportunity to make fast and efficient use of rainwater for those non-potable purposes within a building is tremendous. And then, of course, you've got all the landscape makeup waters for irrigation water that's needed in the middle of the public realm where you have turf and other landscape plants. Last but not least, some of the entrainment of water that runs off of the roof that gets into a stream, which is more water than might occur under a natural urbanized area, causes erosion, causes pollution that would not otherwise be there. And by capturing rainwater, you're actually reducing the pollution water on the receiving water bodies. We learned in Austin over the last 30 years, and we informed the rest of the nation and the world, we really found out here that in heavily urbanizing areas, the amount of sedimentation and sediment-based erosion that shows up in streams, in urban streams, comes mostly from the banks of the channels themselves, not from soils washing off, because that's a big source, not just from highway runoff, that's a huge source, but from erosion of the stream banks themselves. Because the velocity of water going down urbanized streams is two, three, five times faster than it ever used to be. And they get denuded, and they get wider and shallower, and so the landscape ecology of our drainage networks gets very heavily altered. But it's a source of pollution in its own right because of the extra runoff. So the rainwater system actually reduces urban water pollution, as well as provides a new water supply, as well as provides a great drinking water supply, as well as reduces flood problems and so forth. So it's kind of like a silver bullet if it's realizable. So with that, let me turn it over to Jason to talk through this particular project, and then we'll talk more generally after that.
not necessarily the worst case scenario and use the minimum because we can rely on municipal water system to make up for any different, every differences in the water. So we actually took it a baseline of 75% of water, rainwater supply for the entire year. This allowed us some fluctuations if we had dry days. You can see the second number of days without rainfall in Texas. We fall by about 60. So the maximum days we would go without rainfall is going to be 60 days. And during that time, the municipal water system is going to be stand to take up the slack from this and rainfall. One of the other things that we looked at is a lot of the irrigation and fountains we deal with evaporation. We looked at monthly evaporation, evaporation loss in Austin. This gave us a landscape area and a proportion. So this formula right here is what we use to base the ball of our models. So the collection coefficient, how much water we can collect off of the root system is a percentage of the ball. Give us total evaporation, total gallons for the system. We took into account the evaporation to give us flat water coefficients. So using flat water coefficients, we can determine the amount of water that the irrigation system is going to use and the amount of water that we're going to need per month based on flooded data. From here, we got specifically into our scenarios for the seawall building itself. We had a similar series of different types of rooftop collections. In this one, we're using 65,000 square feet of rooftop collection. That's what currently exists as a power plant for closed office buildings. We took into account the existing cisterns. The field tanks over there are being used as water storage. We're looking at what we would need to add for storage capacities. In the original scenarios, A through D, there were different additional storage from 30,000 gallons from the scenario A up to 100,000 from the scenario B. On scenario B, it's right in the middle, which is this one right here with 60,000 gallons of extra storage. We looked at the water demands evaluated for the year from the irrigation of landscape only. It's going to talk about 814,000 gallons a year. It's almost a million gallons of water a year used just on irrigation. When we put it through our models, which you'll see here in a minute, we came up with total rainwater harvested, which actually is 100% of irrigation demands. At that point, we're still spilling almost 40,000 gallons of rainwater a year. So we're not even collecting the full capacity. This is what we use for our water demand models. You see a couple of columns here with landscape demand. This is what we determined off of evaporative transpiration and particular types of landscape. Total demand met in gallons. We're assuming that we're going to meet 100% of the demand for irrigations in this scenario. And then rainfall collected, the amount of rainfall based on that 75% quartile per month. What you end up with is this gray column right here. We started with 25,000 gallons in storage in the first month. That's assuming that the municipal water supply will fill the storage tanks with 25,000 gallons. And you can see as the year goes out, in the earlier months, you actually have excess storage. And you're filling the tanks up to 117,000 gallons. At this point, you start to spill. And then in the drier month in the summer, we start to actually use the water that we store in the tanks. So at the end of the year, you're actually at 60,000 gallons of water as opposed to the original 25,000 that you started. Yeah, yeah. If you're negative, you're just negative for the month. Yeah, you're negative for the month. So what is actually happening is you start with 25,000 gallons, and you're adding rainfall collected, but you're only using a shorter month. I mean, in the winter months, you're using less water for your data. Yes? If your spill is happening in the first four months, why would you add 25,000 gallons? The tanks have to be filled with something to start with. And so the assumption is that in the beginning, you're going to have some amount of rainwater collected before you actually put the system stuff on. What you're actually looking at is at the end of the year, you're going to have almost 60,000 gallons of storage as opposed to the original 25. You don't want to let the tank, you try to not let the tanks go empty. Is this a criteria for turnover of the water? Yes. The tank stays, there's water in the tank, so that's what you're treating. The tank's actually going to have to be charged with the water. So it was an old power plant, and it had as many as five turbines, and the turbines had to be cooled, and so water was withdrawn from Town Lake into a storage tank, which is there, and then the water would be washed over the turbines to cool them through a series of cooling pipes, 
And then the hot water was taken down to the bottom of the power plant into a sump from which there was a pump that would take it to a series of two tanks, which are called overflow weirs. And these weirs, these, these are storage tanks that are in the ground today with 60,000 gallons of storage. And the water would cool off for a few days until it got to a temperature that wouldn't kill the fish in Shell Creek. And it would finally overflow at a point and then flow into Shell Creek and then back into Town Lake. So this cooling system for the power plant is now a built-in uh, cistern, which means roughly half the storage that we figured would be economically feasible for the power plant plus the new office building that would be built there. Is this um, spillage taking effect in the first wash system? Is there first wash yeah, this, these tables actually all are worked out on a 90% collection capacity for the system. So you're taking the first 10% off of that system as the first flush and everything. Plus whatever you lose, because the system is not 1% efficient, despite collecting rainwater off the surface. So that's actually built, that's built right into the rainwater collected in the alleys. We took that off the top of the can. So even with that, even with the 90%, you're still looking at rainwater spillage from the earlier months of the year. Part of that goes back to looking at our rainfall data. I mean, the months April, March, April, May, you can get more rainfall up to the UI. And this is what I'm in the SO. Okay. So if you run a model and you calculate these things, we had 75 years of daily rainfall records. And we looked at the different types of months over that period, so it's 75 January, so let's say. And you look at the different size of rainfall events, and you assume something like 10 gallons per 1,000 square feet of roof area will be taken away and flushed and not put into the cistern because it'll have debris in it. Mm -hmm. So some rains won't generate more than 10 gallons per thousand square feet, a drizzle. You know. But another rain will generate 500 times that. So when Jason says 10% is removed because of the efficiency of the system for flushing, that's looking at the, the whole climatology of all the kinds of rainfall events that we have in Texas and figuring that into this generalized model. Figure out in general what the what are we going to get out of the system in the future based on uh, history? So, case you're not familiar, this is CNOM, looking at from the top. Um, the collection, most of the collection is underground at this point. Uh, one of the things that was not feasible was above the ground storage for aesthetic reasons. Uh, so, at the moment, just a couple things. The original value. Uh, volume of the storage tanks and the storage tanks right here, we're looking at uh, what, 280,000 cubic feet. So we're going to have to add storage underground to continue this project. And as Kent was mentioning, one of the things that's big in this is the 145,000 square feet of impervious cover. When we're collecting rainwater, we no longer send that to stormwater retention. That was one of the things that we also considered the stormwater management with this project. This is the Seaholm project sketch. Um, so you can see the extensive amount of landscaping that's being developed all around the outside edges. And here at one point there was close to 12,000 square feet of fountains. Um, working with us and with our models, we've actually downgraded that to close to 2,000 square feet. The feasibility of all those fountains and all that irrigation and using a rainwater system just didn't quite pan out. They are very expensive. So this was the original model, as we said right here. It was originally about 12,000 square feet. This is what we took into effect when we looked at our scenarios. And about 60,000 square feet of landscape. Uh, so what we did is we took that 65,000 square feet of landscape, determined the type of plants that they were using, came up with a coefficient for plant water use, and to come up with our scenarios and what we required for the water. Is there any discussion I mean, obviously the fountains were rest, but this kind of thirsty landscaping. Maybe. We did. We looked at a couple different levels of landscaping, and one of the things we suggested for this project was that you use landscaping that's more native to Texas. Uh, we had three or four different coefficients for landscaping and how much water we used. And some of the stuff that was originally proposed, some of the trees, there was no way around it. There would be large use of landscaping. We had originally broken it down into landscaping and trees uh, to give us a better idea of the model that is really complicated. So we took an average of the landscaping. 
Did that drive them to make any decisions at all? At the time that we were working on this project, there were no specific plans for what type of plans were going to be installed and what was going to be put in there. One of the things we saw... So these were their renderings of what they wanted to be green and what they wanted to be found and what they wanted to be in various colors. When we talked to the engineer who did the renderings, he said, well, we're not really sure what
for water savings. This takes into the water rate 350 per thousand gallons, depending if you're buying it from the municipal system, and the amount of water collected. So we're collecting almost a million gallons of water a year, but you're still only saving about $2,800 per year. With that file, we figured out a basic set of years to make your money back on the system. Considering water inflation prices, which right now I believe are right about 5%, which is a fairly conservative estimate at the moment, even with scenario B, which is the most effective site, you're still looking at 18 years before you ever make any money off of this water system. Which still begs the question then of why would you use rainwater systems as opposed to municipal systems. Despite the fact that, that this is the case, we probably still recommend that you see home that they install a rainwater system. It looks like they're going ahead with that project. And they're using something very similar to scenario B, which adds about 60,000 gallons worth of storage and takes care of all the irrigation for the project. Yes. Yes. One of the things that one of the things that we did when we were dealing with this project is while we considered those things and we took them into account, when we were preparing this report for Sea Home, they were trying to prepare a report for the city. They're trying to get concessions from the city to pay for the system as well. So one of the things that was really difficult for us to do was to put dollar values on things that you couldn't quantitatively define. So savings to the city, runoff problems, you know, erosion in the area, reducing pollution on town lake, all these things we put a dollar value on. So this report specifically deals with dollar cents. Do you know if the city though is trying to get that? Yes, they are. They're negotiating that. But the city ultimately will will either give or give credit for something on the order of ten to twenty million dollars as their share of this public private partnership. Based on their assessment of what the savings would be. Yeah. So yeah. This is a small piece of that. But part of it is concerning the savings. Absolutely. Well because stormwater management. Yeah. So if the city can use can can see this rainwater system installed, and if you can think about the extrapolation over the entire core of Austin, all of downtown Austin let's say, the the existing infrastructure in the ground, the water pipes that provide water, now can be stretched to serve more capacity than before because we're putting less demand in particular we're putting less demand at the peak time when you're irrigating lawns in the hot part of summer. So you're shaving the peak demand on the infrastructure and that reduces the demand for things like the water treatment plant number four that is designed for peak day capacity. Every piece of the infrastructure has a different design parameter to it, but the big things like water plants are for peak day. So it directly affects infrastructure cost, the marginal cost of the peak size of that plant. And then in addition it provides other savings. The city has the former utility director who recently retired estimated that water rates in the city are going to go up by at least five percent per year for the next five years anyway. And that's because we're building a new water plant and we're growing very fast and we're at one of those quantum stages where we need to finance a lot more debt. And realistically I don't have a real solid basis for this, but I would guess that water rates are going to go up by five to eight percent per year for the next ten or twenty years. And as such the life cycle cost analysis for the payback period is probably a lot less than 18 years, maybe 14, 15 years. And this is a 60 year lease, 50 or 60 year lease of the land from the city. The city actually will own the building and the certainly the land always at the end of that lease period. So the city has an investment in this whole process as well. So that's where you really begin to see some more of the synergies and maybe a little more excitement if you will in terms of why we should all be thinking about these things. In your initial remarks you didn't mention the benefit of the reduction in energy costs to pump water around the city. My understanding is that the single largest energy expenditure in the city of Austin is actually to do that, 
actually pump water around the city. So a distributed infrastructure like this eliminates that cost altogether. So is, have you ever tried to calculate that, or in this case, did you try to calculate that? Well, in, a, in, a, in the edges of the city, it, it would make a difference. Uh, and it was off-grid. This won't be off-grid. It will still be connected for local purposes. So the pressure will still be there, even though there are a lot less users. So it doesn't effectively save it on this particular project. And in the in the urban core areas, one of the problems is that we, we want to be averse to the risk of a fire. And so we have fire flow demand calculations that we make. And those so far exceed the daily water demands in a peak situation. And we have to have that under pressure. So in a facility like this, you might need to have the capability of tapping say six or seven fire hydrants simultaneously and running the water for four hours nonstop. So you might need something like 4,000 gallons per minute for four hours nonstop. Uh, you know, and so that kind of pressure available at all times is outstrips you know, the, the benefits that, that we could otherwise calculate. If in the future we grow new edge cities and we think about this ahead of time with reuse systems or non potable systems and so on. We can learn a lot from history. Older cities have dual systems. Like uh, a lot of Chicago has a dual system in the industrial areas where fire flow demand is met through fire pipes. And they use lake water for fire demand in the industrial areas. They don't treat it. They don't keep it under that same system of quality municipal potable water. It's the same So the, the Houston Ship Channel is no longer flammable water, so they can use that for the <laughs> <laughs> But what we're, what we're beginning to see is in the, in the area of uncertainty and risk and, and uh, things like 911. If you partly that, not into worrying about terrorism attacking Austin, but the terrors ourselves, we need to be ready for uncertainty and be more resilient. Having another source of water. I mean, right now we get water out of Colorado River, and that's it. We have no other source of water. Shouldn't we have a more diversified stock portfolio in something so precious as water? Maybe a few wells, maybe a tap on rainwater as well as the Colorado River. And as such, this begins to provide a little more resilience, a little more backup for, you know, incrementally as we face the next century. And I think in the long run, it may cost a little more but it may well be strategically the smartest thing we could do in the event that we, we find something going wrong with one of our other sources of water. Um, just on the cost side, I mean, one of the criticisms of you know, more kind of leading edge sustainable technology is that actually operational maintenance costs are quite high because there's not a lot of expertise in how the systems work. There's not craft workers or repair personnel who really are familiar with the system. So there's not a breakdown. The systems oftentimes haven't been scaled to a level where the parameters and the technology are really well known. Is this, a, is this a concern in the system? Is this system just so simple that any uh, plumber or, or uh, maintenance worker can master it? And I didn't really see it. Oh, yeah, I saw a replacement cost. But it's, you know, Virtually all the, let's just call it plumbing, okay? in, a, in, a, in an industrial commercial scale, it's all plumbing. Okay? Virtually all the plumbing that, that you might be thinking of is something that has to be managed by the private owner of the building anyway. And they, it's nothing, they, they have the same plumbing. obligation with this as they would otherwise. The only difference here is that there's a, a source of water that comes through one pump that, out of the cistern that, that energizes and activates the system to, to run the same irrigation system they would need otherwise. The same heads on the fountain water makeup that they would have otherwise. The same sprinkler heads. This, all that has to be done by a master irrigator or some private maintenance into into anyone. So the only difference is the one pump that pumps it out of the cistern. You know, maybe a three horsepower pump might cost five hundred dollars. So we I mean, we took into account an additional maintenance system, but not the overall maintenance cost of the entire system. That's what in this one the maintenance is that you have per year. Oh, I said per year. Per month, per year. 
is basically an additional system, not the overall system of the entire, the overall maintenance of the entire large system. You know, I was saying earlier that a lot of these long-range thinking, where we're studying things in class, so you'll be ready five, ten years from now when this becomes really important and more common. And I'm saying that the future is now. Rainwater systems are mandatory in much of Australia, in much of West Germany, in certain parts of China. They are, there are 400,000 rainwater systems in the, installed by one company in Australia alone. They are soon to be mandatory in various parts of the United States. There's one city that has a mandatory in Central Texas now. And they are, they are ubiquitous. What city is that? City of Utah, South Dakota. For commercial buildings of 5,000 square feet or more, you must have a rainwater system. So, now is the time to be understanding these things. And it is all off-the-shelf technology. It's all quite low maintenance compared to what municipal water works maintenance is all about. So, in that sense, if someday this kind of approach were taken to the next level of being, you know, decentralized facilities, building by building, but centrally managed by a utility, that kind of a model is a very exciting model. Because then you can have the assurance that we have of a central utility now, having really highly qualified people whose job it is to look at it every day, even though we may not look at it ourselves. But still have that distributed system, which in some ways is more reliable in that if something happens from the point of view of resilience, the redundancy is a nice thing to have. The tanks that are manned as additions, those are envisioned to be actually located underground, you mentioned? That's one of the things that we were required to do, was that all the tanks had to be underground. There is no provision for above-ground tanks based on the aesthetic concerns for the site. They want all these plazas to be in the city center, to be open and kinetic without having any more blockage. So all the tanks that we looked at, all the prices we looked at for tanks, included an excavation cost carrying them above ground. One option is, you know, looking at where would you put it and how would that best work. The Seton Hall Power Plant itself is an interesting building, and the ground, the lowest floor, which is below the ground surface, has below that a six-foot deep chamber that was used as the drainage to the sump for all the water that came across the turbine. And so you have this zone of six feet deep below the ground floor of what the retail might be inside the Seton Hall Power Plant. It runs for 80 or 90 feet in length. And a lot of rainwater storage tanks in the world are these very elongated, kind of squash cigar-shaped polyethylene tanks that you can buy in 10, 20, 30, 40,000 gallon sizes that are about four to five feet tall. So you can lay them in place right underneath the floor of the Seton Hall Power Plant on a floor that actually has a grade to it that takes it to a sump anyway if it ever did leak. So the retrofit opportunity to put more storage in the same location is very strategic. So that's what we're recommending to consider. Was there any consideration on your guys' part about what kind of material the underground storage tanks would be? Is it going to be ferrous cement or is that something that was not part of the analysis? Is that the cost? The new ones that would be added? Yeah. Well, there's a lot of different materials, a lot of different costs. If they're underground, they won't be subject to ultraviolet light, so you don't have to get a material that's UV resistant or black. And if it's going to be in the ground, you need to figure that out. But if it goes under the building on racks, you know, you could probably go with a lower cost product that would not be subject to a lot of degradation. So there are half a dozen different materials and several dozen different manufacturers, so that's really just kind of a consumer analysis thing. Unless you're using it for potable water, then you want to make sure that it's the right kind of tankage for that purpose. When we figured out the cost, we figured out not the worst case scenario, kind of like when we took the water, the rain and the fall data, we took about the 75th 
the 80th percentile is average. So higher than the average cost to obtain the lowest and highest, but certainly not the most expensive cost. And when we set up those models, as you saw, we want to start with the three columns. All those considerations, we actually were able to adjust. So if we decided that we wanted to use a specific type of tank, you could have gone back in and run the cost data with that as well. So the class of the team was two architecture students, three planning students, three civil engineering students, two of which were working and getting degrees in engineering construction management. So they had already developed for other purposes benefit, cost, and feasibility economic models to lay right in the discount rates and the life cycle cost and replacement value. So they adapted their models to this. And so we were able to run lots of iterations earlier on in the semester so that we were able to inform the design process with the economic information, which is a very valuable thing. Because the bottom line is it will pay for itself and can you convince somebody that it makes sense to do it. So we did another project along with this one in the class called a residential subdivision, a retrofit for a 42-lot subdivision, and it just didn't work out. It just wasn't feasible. So we had to tell the residents who asked us to do the study because they really wanted to put in a community-wide rainwater system. And it just would never pay for itself. And there's a lot of legal problems that we can't solve without you going to the legislature to get a new bill. What was the limitation? Well, this is a community that wanted to have rainwater systems, 42 lots. Three of the homes already had rainwater systems. So you've got a very conscientious group, right? Well, they already were not irrigating their lawns at all. And so there wasn't any, you know, low-hanging fruit to pluck. Oh, yeah, they were lavish water users. We could have helped them a lot. They had buffalo grass, so they didn't mow it. They restored it to a natural prairie. They were using 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 gallons per month per house, whereas the typical resident in Hayes County was using 11,000, 12,000, 13,000 gallons. So they would have put a lot of money into the system, but then they wouldn't have been able to get the money back. But they had a swimming pool, a community swimming pool. So we looked at the idea of putting a little cistern in every house, maybe about a 1,000-gallon cistern, that would capture the runoff of one big rain. And it would typically have an open valve, so it would drain on out slowly through gathering lines to one or two central tanks that would be located near the community swimming pool. And so the makeup water for the swimming pool would be the runoff from their rooftops. And they wouldn't have to pump from their precious well, which was one well had already started to go down, and they had already drilled a second well. And they were looking at, from a risk assessment, they wanted to go to rainwater because they were afraid they were going to run out of water. They wasn't going to pay for it. There just was no other source in Hayes County. Several wells have been dry in the last several months. Did you try to consider that? Did you have a possibility of that? What's your possibility of getting water? We did evaluate the cost of a new well or other sources of water. Even adding in the cost of drilling new wells, it just wasn't economically feasible. It wasn't that they were looking at. They were looking at the cost that we discussed earlier. How do we put values on these other costs that don't have a dollar value? And I think they ended up going to rainwater. They went mostly to rainwater because of their income, despite the fact that we couldn't find the savings. It's retrofit for existing houses. So the cost of, is this roof going to be suitable or not? Sometimes it would, sometimes it wouldn't. For a new community, it's a different equation. Is there ways to fold it in to the cost of roofs and gutters and downspouts and such anyway? So is this information and this model being suggested to other power plants or other parts of the city? Are they all sharing this beyond the Seahawk Power Plant? Somewhat. There's a lot of dissemination going on. Next week, the American Rain Catchment Systems Association holds its national conference in Phoenix. The International Rain Harvesting Systems Association holds its 
conference next November in Honolulu. So there are people all over the world looking at commercial applications. In, in uh, Singapore, I believe it is, 80% of all the buildings in central Singapore, many of which are major skyscrapers, 80% have rainwater systems right now. So the, we're just catching up. I, I would probably have to say that there's probably not much that we're discovering that would really be of great value to a lot of other parts of the world. I mean, even within. Even within. Well, within, yes, we're, you know, another graduate of the School of Architecture has a job right now for the city. He works for the city, watershed management, to develop a spreadsheet to calculate how much would it be worth from the city's regulatory point of view if a, if a commercial operation puts in a rainwater system to reduce peak stormwater flow to then let them downsize their stormwater detention ponds by that amount. And, and how much credit should be given because what we do with water quality and stormwater management in Austin is very expensive. And that alone is probably going to induce rainwater systems prevalently. I had breakfast this morning with someone who works for Walmart. And they have uh, one store with a 125,000 gallon underground storage tank rainwater system in Austin under their parking lot. And they're building a second one right now. And Walmart is. I forget the number, Stephen. We had lunch with this VP uh, from Walmart. I think it was something like they're shooting for 40% of all future Walmart stores to have rainwater systems. And in three years' time, in that trajectory, they will have exceeded the total square footage of rainwater collection on planet Earth. A lot of his statistics were all, oh my gosh, you're really that big. <laughs> They are, they are really big. I, I've learned more since then about you know, one Walmart store that has 4 million customers a month. And all, overall, Walmart has 140 million customers per week. And, and their growth rate is huge, not so much in the United States, but elsewhere. But anyway, that, that's not to say they're part of the solution. I'm just saying it's, it's becoming very prevalent. I think it's something that should be kind of 101 for all of us to think about integrating infrastructure into buildings, uh, making water an integral part of a design as opposed to just something you plumb and wire and, and then hook it up and you're good to go. It's, it should be more integral. Yeah. It seems like one of the lessons of this, though, is how incredibly important it is for the city to, to work out how to value it some traction with the city. It didn't get much traction with the Lord Colorado River Authority. Well, I don't know. I'm thinking about end uses at Seaholm, uh, the fountains specifically. Are there any sort of assumptions that come from having a centralized coordinated water supply that might um, not work from a certain point of view for you know, rainwater Some kids stepped in the fountain and played around and drank a little bit with the city, and certainly the city home people would be liable if someone got sick from a, a water surface that was connected in some way to a municipal source from a liability point of view. Well, the rainwater systems need to be disinfected too, and they, they, all, they always should be, even if it just goes through a sprinkler system. And that can be done either through uh, ozonation or ultraviolet light or chlorination. 
And in the School of Architecture, we have one student who has his own company, and they install rainwater systems. And as a rule, he only installs chlorinators. I, I don't think that's a good idea myself, but he finds that that's what he finds the most safe and most accepted by his clients. So they're, they're chlorinating every rainwater system they put in. So in that context, it should be as safe as the management of the system is, as is Austin system. But obviously, the EPA, if Austin runs its municipal water works properly, it should have zero chlorine in it when it comes out of your tap. Zero residual chlorine. But it still does have some, typically, but you're not supposed to have chlorine in your water anymore after it finally comes out, because there's chemical complexes that, uh, I forget what they're called, but, uh, try, uh, let's just say chlorine is not a panacea either. Sure. Right. Um, there actually are, <coughs> Texas Code of Health, or Health Code, has stipulations for non portable water systems that are used in farms. There are certain guidelines you have to follow. There are certain amounts of disinfectants you have to take care of before you can put it out in the farms, even if it's not to be drank, even if you post a sign that says no swimming. There are certain levels that you have to maintain as well. I would imagine that would pull through for toilets or flushing. Yes. This figure came out of a final report that came out last week from a special state task force on uh, rainwater system standards that uh, will be submitted back to a joint legislative committee this next session of the legislature. And uh, they're looking to establish water quality standards, installation uh, professional standards, as well as plumbing standards for rainwater systems for Texas. And uh, there'll be a follow-up committee to that as well to advise on, on legislation to adopt those. And I've been asked to serve on that committee. But the, the, the lack of standards is actually a problem right now. If you talk to the, any of the seven or eight rainwater system installers in Central Texas, if you talk to one of the really good ones, they say, we so welcome tough standards because that will separate the, the good guys from the bad guys. You know? Those that do a good job anyway, will benefit from higher standards. Yeah. Yeah. The assurance that regulatory compliance is uh, is there at some level. That's good to market those standards. It's the information is the information is just what's this cost of risk of this case. But I mean this thing, I mean it seems to me that this is like a really opportune time if you've got this one sold, to really look at the benefits of substantially scaling up across downtown Austin because the whole development vision for Central Business District is 40,000 people, a huge increase in residential, uh, there's ongoing development there. The scale of the, the underlying infrastructure is going to be stressed. So the extent to which you can show that Installing this uh, system across, and there's lots of rooftops, obviously, that uh, could increase the effective capacity of the existing airport system. Uh, it seems like they'd be very interested in that right now. Is there, uh, I mean, well, no, no, no. No, I mean, is there doing, they're supposed to be doing a downtown plan, right? Or, like, the fifth or sixth downtown plan. Yeah, so there's, you know, I mean, it seems like this is the intro to that. But the report that the panel is talking about that the Justice published discusses that as well. You know, what happens if you take 10% of Dallas, using Dallas as a baseline, 10% of Dallas is through the tops, and you produce close to a million gallons a year as well. The amount of percentages in the amount of water that you produce is pretty staggering. Yeah, I mean, a large amount of the water rights in Dallas would be extended you know, by that as well. You know, ultimately it gets into how much water do you have, the water rights. You know, Austin is now in the position of having given, spent a hundred million dollars for the paper access to water rights a few years ago, and now spending eight million a year for water rights. And we'll go up to 16 million a year when we start using a certain amount more forever. Well, it depends, depends on how, on how long we can stretch our water conservation. 
Yes, I think they're going to go up by 6, 7, 8 percent for a long time. And now we're looking at building another water plant in Austin. So in my class right now, we're exploring, well, what, what special opportunities comes from this new water plant? What if the new water plant were put in a, a different location, which would be almost like a separate zone from the other water plants, where you could induce, or I should say, uh, impose planning and standards of, of water reduction of multiple water sources like rainwater systems, of water reuse, so that using a metaphor of front door planning as opposed to back door planning, we can say that the assumed water demand per living unit or per square foot of commercial building, under these rules that we might adopt for a new district, will be 40% less than what we're using now. We could we can invest 40% less to have the same amount of growth. The backdoor side of that is, if you impose those kinds of rules and get that kind of conservation through this measure or others, then you can take the same amount of infrastructure and get 40% more capacity out of it. But saving on the front end is, is, is untested waters, no pun intended, and very exciting in terms of I think what the community might be excited about. So, I, Actually, what you're saying, I think there's a, maybe the easier, more timely opportunity is to say the next major infrastructure investment we make, why don't we set it as a standard there and see how far we can go with it. But in, the, in, the, in the case of downtown, right, I don't know what the capacity of the existing system is downtown, but if you assume that residential use would triple or quadruple or go up by however many percent. And we have pipes of certain things and pressure systems of certain things. And just say, if, if this might be the case, but just say that at a certain point you're going to have to do a major redo of some of the core mains and components of the infrastructure. Whereas you wouldn't have to do that redo if this was systematically developed. Four years. I don't know. I mean, maybe there's plenty of capacity in the. In well, the fire flow capacity for downtown buildings so exceeds the growth in water demand on a daily basis. So there's plenty of capacity. There's, there's a multiple, multiple times the amount of capacity for fire flow. So it, it, it's not as cost effective for that reason. However, if, if it were designed right to have 40, 50, 60,000 gallons of tank storage, on the site from which firefighting could tap and use, that might be worth something. So then it gets into a whole series of infrastructure management issues of, uh, well, yeah, that's a lot of water. That's that's what we rely on anyway for our water works is having these water storage tanks here and there. This should be worth something. But is it going to be there on July 19th when you have a drought and the fire starts? So then it becomes well, if you're building a storage cistern anyway of 30,000 gallons, the public interest, Liz, as you're suggesting, might be, let's make it 60,000 gallons and keep it 30,000 gallons full at all times. And that's the public share of the, of the tank and then the top share is for the private use. And now we have a factor of safety and the, and the resilient, uncertainty, risk factor of fire or whatever, and it's sitting there ready to be used. But you have to do it throughout the whole down. Really begin to change the, the, the practice. It seems like a runoff issue, right? Well, there's lots of room here, not just for water planners, landscape architects. <laughs> civil engineers, but a lot of other people that have a more comprehensive or integrated approach to solving problems. I, I think the, the two most exciting to me are looking at it from an institutional point of view. How would we carry these things out? It's a combination of law and education and behavior and so forth. And then also the, uh, uh, I'm forgetting what I was going to say. 
it's certainly something that takes a lot more than just the civil engineers who used to handle all this for us in a transparent way or invisible way. The, the fact that a lot of these infrastructure questions become more visible and, and of interest to people, to me, I think is, is transformative and uh, probably be a lot better to be just kind of talking about it. I think cities where you, where you don't have separated uh, sanitary and stormwater, a, there would be a significant potential to you know, delay the cost of having to install separated systems by doing one more collection and then importance and another sort of building, building dollars to you know, do their first separated system. A lot of, a lot of older cities you know, have common sewers. So that's what Okay, I'll, I'll try to finish your sentence for you. And, um, I, I think what you're getting at is that uh, some systems can't be understood in terms of technological problems only. In other words, because all technological systems are socio-technological systems, in other words, they have to be managed and administered and, and maintained you know, by institutions. Um, the, the redesign of those, the human side of the systems, is just as much problem as the redesign uh, of the pipes and valves. And so it will really take uh, collaborative uh, groups um, of people, of lawyers, economists, business people, public policy experts to, to, to develop a new design. It's not just the objects. You know, what we've seen, this is anecdotal and political, but what, what I see in Austin is the competition among utilities to be the ones to serve areas and so forth. It's, it's more about growth of infrastructure and enterprises than it is being a service provider. So to the extent that we can <coughs> communities to really think about utilities as service providers, then we can really ask the open-ended question, you know, what kind of service do we want? And then we can talk about reliability and efficiency and uh, things that are not necessarily all about building more technology and more capacity, but, but doing things smarter, maybe with more shared responsibility and so forth. And, uh, and ultimately, we can, we can be more resilient and still accommodate more growth and have less impact on, on the, uh, in the environment as the, the ultimate recipient of what we do right or do wrong. Uh, we have a little bit of time left. Any other questions or comments? <laughs>